and Solomon. What good afternoon, the Holy Trinity. <laughs> I will begin with an acknowledgement of country. Many have gone before who have cared for this land in the ways that they have lived and the stories they have told. We give thanks for the Ghana people who have held as sacred the duty of protecting the land and living in harmony with it. And we commit to walking together into the future. Let me just tell you a little bit about Darrell. Darrell is a member of Adelaide West Uniting Church and he has been ever since its inception in 2002. And I recall that vividly because when Adelaide West was first established, there were a group of people who planted some shrubs around the car park and we planted Westringias all along the eastern boundary. And Daryl and I planted one together, and that was the only one that survived. <laughs> and I think that must have been because of Daryl. But I don't think it's a very good place for Westringias because that one's not even there now. <laughs> so, not a good idea. Daryl is an accomplished presenter, having completed a PhD in 2019 at Flinders University, where he investigated the lived experience of people with physical and communication disabilities in their difficulties in developing romantic and intimate relationships. Daryl has just come back from presenting a paper in July in Mexico, accompanied by food, and uh, he's presenting that paper this afternoon. If you enter Dr. Darrell Selwood into your search engine, you will find lots of information about him. And I was reading some stuff, biographical information last night and I'd like to just share this quote. Darrell believes that his strong Christian faith has been pivotal in enabling him to keep moving forward with his life despite living with complex communication difficulties and significant physical disability. Christianity provides a framework within which Darrell finds hope and encouragement. And I think that is a great statement which typifies his life. So, Darrell's going to explain himself what he's going to do this afternoon. So we'll go through the presentation and then there will be opportunity for discussion and questions and answers afterwards. And Ferg is here as Daryl's, now what did he ask me to call him? His communication assistant, who will be revoicing some of the things that Daryl says. So I'm sure we'll be inspired as Daryl leads us through this topic, can sex, Dating and flirting be supported by alternative and augmentative communication. So, over to you. Thank you, Edward. Yeah. Oh, uh, do I need a mic? <laughs> oh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, no, to be fully recorded, yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
We just have a break. You don't want to put this one there? No, you want to hold, just hold it in your hand. Sure. Is that right? Fine. And so the first thing Daryl said was, thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Desmond, for an awesome introduction. <laughs> and I do remember us doing the planting together. <laughs> It's just revoicing, so that way you understand me. I thought, why not present to you the paper that I presented in Mexico at an international conference? So the 
conference was the Isaac International Conference. As the International Society of Alternative and Augmentative Communication. <laughs> In a minute, I'll describe what that all means. Imagine an academic conference. That also has lay people and children and parents and teachers. And, and people with disabilities all combining with each other. Talking. All talking with each other. About how people communicate and how to help. It's an awesome conference. Oh, he said we've been to five or four. I think we've been to four. And we love it. <laughs> It refers to different ways that people can communicate. The first one is augmentative. That's when you augment something. This microphone is augmenting his voice. And that way you can hear him. But he's using his own voice. I am using my voice. Uh, but this tool. <laughs> so he is revoicing me. This baby. <laughs> this baby. <laughs> if I use this baby. <laughs> it is an alternative to my voice. So it's it's all AIC. There are many methods of communicating. I do do a whole lecture on what that is, but we won't do that today. Oh, you get the idea.
heard him. So it can be pointing at what you want on a on a communication board. Uh, complex communication needs. It's actually a controversial term at the moment. say that we have to change words because it doesn't seem right. So I'm using this term to mean people like me with physical disability. They might have an intellectual disability. But they have trouble using their own speech for everyday tasks. I just wanted you to understand those terms before we get into the paper. Oh, and hopefully afterwards we'll have a bit of a discussion. Where you can ask any question. So, so that's the title slide, um, as Esmond's introduced. Will you? Okay, I'm going to press the button and then I'm going to get out of the way. Today, I will present and discuss findings from my doctoral research. I completed a PhD at Flinders University in South Australia in 2019. My research investigated the lived experiences of people with complex communication needs in developing romantic and sexual relationships. In this session I will be focusing on findings relating to flirting, dating and sexual experiences that participants in the research reported, and in particular how AAC influenced these experiences. Let's start with a story. On the way to the 2016 Isaac Conference in Toronto, Canada, I decided to stop over in San Francisco. I took a support worker with me. Let's call him Anton. One evening in San Francisco, after a full day, Anton and I planned to have a meal before heading back to the hotel. People who have communication and physical disabilities can rarely be spontaneous. Frequently, we must plan, even to do routine tasks. Going back to our hotel, I heard a song from my childhood. Being sunny in a bar, I had to go in. I decided to join a couple of women dancing near me. Starting a conversation with them, I used a mixture of communication techniques, which included using my communication device. After dancing for a while, one of the women offered to buy me a drink. Let's call her Joanne. Relaxing on a stool with her shoes off from dancing and helping me take a sip of my drink, Joanne put one of her legs across my lap and rested her foot on a stool, which was close to my wheelchair. I started massaging her bare foot, which she seemed to enjoy. My thoughts went to Shuttleworth's 2000 research project about men with cerebral palsy seeking intimacy. One of his dating recommendations was to offer foot rubs to potential partners. As a doctoral candidate with a disability, it was not my intention to turn this moment into research. Yet I remember thinking 
I now have evidence that supported Chateau's findings. Enjoying the moment, I realized I had decisions to make. Some of these decisions any man would have to make, such as whether or not to continue flirting which could lead to something more. But I had additional decisions to contend with because of my disability. Would a hotel room be accessible? If we went to the room Anton and I shared, what would Anton do for the night? How would I transfer from my wheelchair onto the bed? Would Jay understand my speech if we went to bed together? What would happen if I needed assistance that Joy did not feel comfortable with? I decided to retire as gracefully as I could, and, after exchanging Facebook details and numbers, we said our goodbyes. I used this true story in the prologue of my thesis to set the scene. It highlights some of the issues people with complex communication needs experience in daily life. I also think it is a useful introduction to today's session. In preparing this presentation, I realized that we have a title of the paper in the wrong order. Rather than sex, dating and flirting, it probably makes more sense to talk about flirting, dating and sex. That seems to be more the common pathway. Although, it isn't always the case. Humans usually have a strong need to develop romantic relationships. However, while we arguably don't really understand human courtship, the reality is probably different to what we're used to seeing in the movies. More people with disabilities are exploring the use of online dating to find potential romantic and sexual partners. One of the advantages of online dating sites is that they're often text-based, which allows people to communicate at their own rate and choose when and how to disclose their disability. The use of text messages for flirting and in romantic relationships is also very common in the broader community. The normalization of this type of communication could be seen as positive for people with communication disabilities. However, recent sobering research into the attitudes of young people in Australia and Hong Kong shows a clear reluctance towards dating people with disabilities. There is little research investigating the lived experiences of people with complex communication needs in developing romantic and sexual relationships. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, 2006, asserts people with disabilities have equal rights as others to participate in social relationships and acknowledges the additional barriers they face. The lived experiences of people with congenital disabilities in developing intimate relationships have rarely been included in disability and sexuality literature. The augmentative and alternative communication literature generally focuses on building communicative competency, education, living skills, social networks and employment. A systematic review of the literature was undertaken into the perceived barriers and facilitators' experience to socializing, sharing intimacy and expressing sexuality of people with communication and physical disabilities. Findings of the review revealed that people with communication and physical disabilities do develop romantic and sexual relationships, but little is known of their lived experiences and the barriers and facilitators they encounter. For my PhD, I researched the lived experiences of people with complex communication needs in developing romantic or sexual relationships. A paper about this research was published in the AAC journal last year, C. Selwood and Others, 2022. Today, I am presenting on the findings which relate to whether flirting, dating and sex can be supported by AAC devices and strategies. The methods used in the research have been described in the paper published in the AAC journal. The references on the screen. Briefly, I conducted interviews face-to-face, -face, either in person or over Skype, with nine adults who had communication and physical disabilities. A theoretical framework was developed to explore the lived experiences, drawing on the concept of ableism, critical hermeneutics, feminist standpoint theory and the international classification of functioning, disability and health, ICF, model. The findings presented today relate to experiences of flirting, 
meaning and sex reported by six of the participants. We have used pseudonyms to protect their privacy. All the participants had physical and communication disabilities and used multiple AAC strategies and devices. For more detailed information, refer to my PhD thesis which is available online. The ages of these participants discussed in this presentation ranged from 21 to 60, with four females and two males. All had high school education or higher. The findings revealed that most had enjoyable sex lives. Two of these participants were in ongoing relationships and the majority identified as heterosexual. In this session I will discuss the results as I present them, but first I will introduce the experiences we will discuss. The direct quotes have not been edited, and they have been revoiced by actors. Katie met an able-bodied male at a restaurant, and they had several dates, before becoming friends with benefits. Jasmine was at a concert when an able-bodied male started to dance with her. They were getting on very well when other people guided him away from her and made him leave the premises. She did not see him again. Jasmine also reported connecting with a different able-bodied male through a dating website and communicating online before they eventually met and started a sexual relationship. Oscar used LBGTIQ plus dating websites to connect with able-bodied males for sex and used to enjoy seeing their reaction when they realized he had a disability. Now he is more careful being upfront about his disability before meeting in person. Samuel reported experiences with a male friend who also had complex communication needs who was a nudist. They would go on the roof of a public building where his friend asked him to undress. They also went to bed together. Emma met an able-bodied man at a hotel. At the time, her AAC device was a Canon communicator that printed on strips of paper. Other people collected the printouts, read them and his turn, but the man ended up living with her for several years. Sophie was teaching her able-bodied male friend sign language and they ended up in bed together. Morgan and others, 2022, argue that flirting can have multiple objectives beyond looking to develop relationships, including having fun and building self-confidence. Jasmine explained that she enjoyed the royal occurrence of being pursued and flirted with by a stranger. We danced for ages. He thought I was stunning and wanted to date me. He wanted to know if I found him hot. He was tickling and kissing me, even on the lips. I didn't feel anything when he kissed me, but I didn't pull away either. I was totally engrossed by him. I wasn't able to talk to him, and I didn't know how to kiss him back. His touch wasn't perverted, everything he did was about impressing me. He wanted me to hug him, and I felt frustrated that I couldn't. He got excited when my friend went away and we were alone. He was such a sweet man and he cared about impressing me and what I thought of him. I ran over his foot and he didn't seem to notice. He tried so hard to dance with me. Just when the chance of romance with a potential partner was blooming, Jasmine reported that her friends and security staff were concerned for her safety and took it upon themselves to usher him out of the door without first checking with her. She explained how having an able-bodied man show her attention made her feel sexually desirable, although, she added, The whole time I was a bit suspicious of him, thinking I wasn't the real woman he wanted. This made me, in a way, put up a barrier between us until it was too late. Following that night, she tried to reconnect with the man, but was unable to locate him. Reflecting on the incident later, she said, Wow, an able-bodied guy made me feel desirable, sexy, and wanted me physically and emotionally. But she perceived that the surrounding people rejected her womanhood by having him removed. However, she said this experience boosted her self-esteem. He made me believe in myself. So I joined an online dating site where I met my partner. Three participants discussed using online dating sites to increase their opportunities to meet potential partners. All three successfully met partners and the two female participants formed long-term relationships. 
Jasmine raised an interesting point related to managing the effects of ableism. She highlighted that going online was an environment where she could personally be in control by saying, I got to know him without anyone else getting involved. Nobody has taken him away from me yet. This control also included the power to decide when and how to disclose her disability. Unlike face-to-face -face interactions, the online environment allowed for a degree of anonymity. Oscar, a young gay male, talked about his first face-to-face -face meetings with men he had met online. Some guys have never met anyone with a disability before, so when I rock up, I open the door, it's like people not knowing how to react. He went on to say that he enjoyed turning up to people's places and seeing their reactions when he came out as disabled. However, he changed his approach over time. I would arrive and a man would like open the door, look at me and decide he don't want to be with me. It happened a lot. So now I tell people I have cerebral palsy, but if people don't want to be with me because of my cerebral palsy, it's not my problem. It seems that he became more careful as he aged. In her interview, Emma said she had recently returned to using online dating sites and made the point that she only disclosed that she had a disability after they had become better acquainted. See? I'm not straight up saying I have a disability. I want them to know me first. Then I say, I have a disability and can't talk, but that makes me almost perfect because I can't win or argue. Put a positive spin on it. Emma described using humour to overcome possible discrimination because of her disability. All the participants in this research experienced ableism in the attitudes of others. This is reinforced by research findings that ableist attitudes in the broader community influence people's perceptions about dating people with disabilities. It was commonly reported that the accessibility of AAC devices was a major issue when in bed. While Sophie could use her AAC device in bed, she reported. I did not like intimate conversations, written or printed. Someone helps. Suggesting text communication is not conducive to intimacy. She preferred to use sign language with her partner. Others developed their own non-aided communication strategies. Katie discussed the methods of communication she used in bed with her male friends saying, We had to use yes or no questions. And? Going through the alphabet. When she was asked if she used any quick gestures, she replied, A smile. Registering good. Wow. Samuel used a more sophisticated strategy with his partner, who also had complex communication needs. He explained their low-tech method that they developed to communicate while they were in bed together. When we slept together, when, if I was unable to see his face, I put my finger in his mouth, start with before L, and he would bite suck me to communicate using the alphabet. The results suggest that in intimate settings, many AAC devices are not conducive to good sex. One of the key implications of this research is the need to acknowledge the huge amount of ableism people with complex communication needs face in all parts of our lives. This is especially true when trying to develop romantic and sexual relationships. Parents and teachers of teenagers and young adults with communication disabilities need to acknowledge this with the people they're supporting and work alongside them as they learn and develop strategies to recognize and manage this rife ableism. This is a growing area, but more research is needed that listens to the experiences of people with physical and communication disabilities in participating in flirtatious, romantic, and sexual activities. This should help us better understand their success stories and how they have approached the barriers they face. This type of research will assist to inform education for young people with disabilities and their supporters, for instance friends, family, partners and professionals. As highlighted by IPANAVIS 2022, we also need broader education in the wider community to help change attitudes toward people with disabilities being considered as potential lovers. Research in this area can also inform developments and improvements to AAC systems and tools.
How amazing would it be if there were AAC friendly sex toys which could empower individuals with complex communication needs to fully engage in intimate moments? I can see such things having a much broader mainstream appeal. I have been encouraged by emerging research in this field, such as Megan Walsh's Australian PhD study looking into the sexuality of young people with communication and physical disabilities. The noteworthy limitations of this research include, although recruitment took place over 13 months and involved numerous approaches, the final participant pool was slightly smaller than we hoped. Communication difficulties of both the researcher and the participants meant a three-hour time limit for each interview was only enough to scratch the surface. Gaining a fuller understanding will take more time and effort. While the project was intended to provide an opportunity for people whose voices are often unheard, the participants may not be a representative sample, and findings may not be transferable to the general population of people with complex communication needs. There has been a focus on the social participation of children and adults with communication disabilities over decades, yet very little on the type of social participation which many of us who are users of AAC possibly have a strong desire and need for. Participation in flirtatious, romantic, and sexual activities. This research demonstrated that, although AAC devices and strategies can assist people with complex communication needs to participate in these kinds of social participation, they are still inadequate in intimate situations. I am involved with a panel here talking about the future of AAC. I would like to see a suite of AAC devices, software, and strategies which allow everyone involved to freely communicate with these through the different phrases of their flirtatious, romantic, and sexual relationships. On a personal note, before finishing and opening up for questions, I would like to acknowledge the support I have received from Associate Professor Pammy Raghavindra and Associate Professor Ruth Walker throughout my PhD candidature and to Dr. Paul Jewell for his endless red herrings. <laughs> I miss you, Paul. Thanks to Pammy and Ruth for their continued support in numerous ways in my postdoctoral career. Um, in your presentation, seems to me there's two sorts of sexual expression, part of an ongoing relationship or a need for sexual expression. I was under the impression that there are some sex workers who specialise in providing sex work for people with communication and physical disabilities. It's a very controversial area. Uh, you're right, they, there are. Sex work is illegal. Um, um, mm. uh, 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 
We did talk to him. He's a great guy. Um, one of the things that's been interesting to me, so I've been to a number of these conferences with Daryl, um, during the, the process of studying and then um, now that it's finished, and starting to see other people do research along similar lines, but it's really this opened up the door to say that this is a conversation worth having. Um, the person I mentioned at the end. Oh yeah, yeah, Megan Moore. Yeah, she's actually jumping off from my research. Uh, going into really interesting, more about sexuality of young teenagers. Research, it would have been hard for her to get that project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But when I saw the Scarlet Road documentary, it made me realise we all, it made me realise that we all need love. But the Bible mentions love throughout. It's meant to be for everyone. But if you're not able, to express to express what you need or do what you need to do. Why can't you have help? Sex, politics, and money. This is about money. <laughs> uh, I'm just sort of wondering about um, does the National Disability Insurance Scheme in any way provide support for the kind of thing you're doing? Uh, it must cost a lot of money to go to a conference in Mexico. So I'm just wondering uh, is, is the NDIS, for example, a source or do they? Are they, do they have the flexibility to um, support what you're doing? I just want to be clear what you're asking. Uh, so you're asking 
about sex workers or are you guys talking oh, no, about no, going no, to no, conferences? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's what it actually is. Just as the NDI has been done, uh, open doors for finance. So you have to pay for your your own flights and accommodation and everything and for the conference. Um, uh, I paid for my flights, but I got paid as a support worker to be providing the same support that Darren would get in Australia. Yeah, we negotiated. <laughs> yeah. So any guys wouldn't pay for the flights, but they'd pay for the support that I okay. provide yeah, in the same way that I would have if it was here. <laughs> So the other side of what I thought you were asking, there, there actually was a case that went to court um, for an NDIS participant uh, um, who had used funding for, for um, sex work. Uh -huh. and, um, and he said, I think she won. NDIS said, no, that's not what we're about. I just want to ask a question about how much things have developed. I don't know if you remember, but maybe 30 years ago, I don't know quite how long, um, I was responsible for student services at the University of South Australia. At that time, we set up a disability room on every campus, and you used to use the one at McGill. I don't know if you remember that. And I just think that the fact that you can complete a PhD and you know, all the resources are available to assist you, that is a huge step forward from what it was. Do you think that, I know you talked about uh, stigma and so on with making intimate relationships, but in general, do you think that there's been a big step forward in the supports, the opportunities, the assisted 
technologies and so on enabling people like yourself to study yeah. and you know great steps forward I think. I do agree in a way. We have come a long way. So, but it is still very hard to do things in this world when you have a severe disability. being on ableism. Or just the, the what idea, what it, what it means and, mm -hmm. and how it plays out. Um, is that something that you'd like to explain, maybe for the people who are watching online? <laughs> yeah. So you used the term ableism, what did you mean by that? Oh, yeah. 
They vary from like insults about your disability. To more subtle things like, oh, you're in a wheelchair, you can't go to there out of the way. As a person with a disability, we get that every day. It's still out there. Yeah. Like casual racism. Like casual racism, yeah. yes. yes. And sexism. We like to think we've got a long way. In all of them, though. That's not going to be very good. Why don't you go up to the pole? The pole might jump. I think he's in the nosing mode. He's still on the nose. No, I'm doubly mind. I would just like to thank you two gentlemen for coming along today, and I'm sorry you weren't more here. Um, certainly opened our eyes to things that we don't know that much about, but I think we know more having listened to you. And we can see that you are a kind of insightful speaker with a wicked sense of humour and, you know, quite inspirational to know the things that you have done and are doing. And we are so pleased that you came along, at least to talk to us, the cream of the crop. So here is just a little token of our thanks. Put that there. And we shall, I'm intending to look at it online as well, because you do get a lot more when you listen to something again. So thank you very much for coming and all the best for your future. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and you can have a cup of coffee now. <laughs> Why don't you tell us and that next, next week as well? Um, oh, and next yeah. week. Oh, yeah, <laughs> That's right. Coming soon. Next <laughs> week, at the same time, two o'clock on the uh, in the afternoon, and this is for people online as well. Come along because we are having a panel on homelessness. We are having Tamika Thompson from the Hutt Street Centre talking about the services that they provide for homeless people. 
We are having Daryl from Fred's Van, who is talking about the services provided by Fred's Van, Van. And we are having Tanya from Orange Sky, which is a mobile laundry service. And she will be talking about the services that they provide. So with all the um, stuff on the TV and the incidence of homelessness these days, I think it's a fairly topical thing that we're doing a panel on homelessness. So do come along. See you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan.